You're listening to Tech Recruit, a podcast that educates talent acquisition and recruitment professionals on innovation to attract talent across all industries. We're glad you're here. Welcome to the Tech Recruit podcast, where we are speaking with Susan Underwood, who is the Director of Talent Acquisition for Envoy. Welcome, Susan. Thank you for having me, Stacey. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, So you have just joined Envoy, and you have a huge undertaking, and that's to build out their talent acquisition team. And uh, this is a new team that you're going to be building. And you just gave me a tour of your office. And it looks like there's a huge amount of space for some good talent to be taking over. And tell me a little bit about uh, what you're going to be doing there. Okay, great. Um, So yes, you're right. I just joined Envoy a couple of months ago. And um, there are about 130 employees right now just closed their Series B funding. And they have a lot of hiring to do and a lot of plans. So the way they grew to the size that they are right now is mostly by using outside agencies, which is working well. They're finding great talent for us, but it's not really a sustainable model because it's a very expensive way to go about doing it. And there are other reasons why you might want an in-house team. So I am tasked with the challenge. We have a really small team in place right now. I have myself, there is one full-time recruiter and one recruiting coordinator, and I'll be tasked with building out the, the team. What is it going to look like? How are we going to transition away from using agencies for basically all tech hiring and all sales hiring? How do we move away from that and bring that all in-house? What is the what does the team need to look like and what are our goals and our OKRs looking like? What, how many uh, recruiters do you plan on hiring? Um, well, I'm waiting for the executive team to finish their workforce planning model. So they are putting together a list of everything that they want to hire over the next calendar year. Mm-hmm. And based on that, I will We'll plug it into my model, which kind of indicates how many recruiters are needed to hire X number of people. So technical roles tend to take a little bit longer, executive or director level and above roles tend to take a little longer, whereas sales roles can sometimes be filled more quickly. So I have a sort of a calculator that I built to help predict some of that. You know, and you really can't Uh, have a better person who will be building out these talent acquisition teams for Envoy because you come with so much experience in doing just that. Um, One of the key roles that you had was building out the talent acquisition team for Glassdoor when it was a small startup, which it's not anymore. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience there? Absolutely. So I was really fortunate. I found a role at Glassdoor. They hired me as their first recruiting person. They also, um, they were about 220 people when I joined and they had gotten to that stage by using a lot of agencies, a lot of hiring managers, just doing their own recruiting. And so I was brought in to do some executive recruiting for them and was basically the first person that they hired with a recruiting title, um, we quickly realized that bringing a lot of the hiring in-house made a lot of sense. And they basically turned to me for, even though I wasn't hired as a director of recruiting, they were turning to me as someone who was um, uh, sort of the, the, the person to help build out that function and figure out what do we need. So we quickly hired a tech recruiter, recruiting coordinator, um, built some recruiting operations. And then once we had our, our data on how many hires they needed to make, then I made some estimates on what size team we would need and how many roles each recruiter could hold and how fast we could potentially fill those roles. And, um, built out the team under me, the, uh, the largest the team was um, at, the, at the peak was uh, 15 people on the team, including myself, um, that consisted of technical recruiters, GNA recruiters, sales recruiters. We had a technical sourcer at one point, recruiting coordinators, as well as a recruiting operations function. So that grew um, slowly. You know, each year we sort of added a few more people to the team. So the process of actually building out 
the talent acquisition team. First, you're, you're saying, okay, we're scaling, we're building, we have a lot of positions we need to hire for, um, and we need the talent acquisition uh, and recruiters to help us do that. And so the, you were saying that the first step in doing um, in, in that process is in getting the approvals and then determining how many hires you made. Now with a startup, it's difficult because you don't really know what your true attrition rate is because you're scaling and you're gonna be bigger. And so looking at historical data can be a challenge, you know, because you're, you're almost kind of going off, well, what, this is what we think could happen. Um, so was, were there challenges in doing that? So for, for trying to figure out how to, how to staff the team, how many people do we need? Yeah, so we looked at the, the workforce plan. So how many people do the executives think they wanna hire? What are we planning on hiring? I do build in a, a line for attrition because we have to staff those as well, even though it's yeah. not a net new headcount, it's still work on the people and recruiting side of the house. So we have to account for that in our staffing models. For me, I have used a combination of historical average for each company. So we need some clean data, at least some estimates in order to make some first assumptions on what the attrition rate might be. And um, then we also have a few different um, benchmark pieces of data that we can use that is pretty indicative based on um, geographic area or company size or stage, what we might expect. So um, I made some, it's kind of just an educated guess and it's okay if it's plus or minus 5% because there's always gonna be a lot of fluctuation in how many people you're hiring. Sometimes you're ramping it up a little bit and sometimes you might be dialing it down a little bit, but in general that attrition number, um, I think as long as you hit it within a, you know, a certain plus or minus, you're you're still okay because recruiting can absorb some of those um, fluctuations. So I, I'm curious, um, one, in, in the type of tools that you, you may use, um, and when you're looking at data, I don't know if there's a way that you present this to your executive board, and I'm also mm -hmm. curious about what you look for in recruiters. Um, so, so if you wanna start with maybe the tools that you use. Yeah, so tools, I mean, bottom line, we're just, um, we're using a great ATS. I've used many of the, the you know, most popular ones out there and they all have pros and cons. So you definitely need a good ATS. Um, other tools, uh, like just for my team in general, we've just been using um, Google Sheets and things like that. So there's not, oh, you know, yeah, so we're using the shared Google documents. Um, at different companies, I've used sometimes a scheduler. So depending on how much hiring we're doing and if we have the proper amount of recruiting staff, there's a couple of different um, automated schedulers out there that are helpful. Um, other tools that are, um, well, Recruiter or Recruiter Lite has been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Some of their uh, some of their competitors um, are also helpful as well. And so I've dabbled in all. Are of you the talking about LinkedIn Recruiter? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, at Glassdoor we use Recruiter Lite, and at Envoy we also use Recruiter Lite. So there's kind of different levels that you might need based on your company size and your team size. And um, let's see, what else? Um, there's a couple other tools that help with referrals and tools that help with um, uh, sort of tracking diversity data and things like that. Oh, so we can talk more about that if you like. Um, I've dabbled with a couple of different tools. Yeah, I, I would be curious. I mean, how, because diversity and inclusion is a very big topic and mm -hmm. it's something that a lot of companies are doing everything that they can to make sure that they are taking advantage of, of the opportunities to do that. And if there's tools out there that you like, definitely share them. Yeah, so uh, at, at LendUp, where I was right before Envoy, we used a tool called Eightfold, and that tool basically yeah. was meant to sort of, it does two things. It, it will dive into your current ATS and compare um, candidates that are in there to your, um, to your open recs. And um, then another thing they do is they're working on their um, integration to help track diversity data. So they have their own, um, their own AI to determine if someone is from an underrepresented 
related group or um, and they have some other ways to figure out if it's male or female and so they can give some reports and some tracking and it's an early stage company so they're building all of this out but that was what we were diving into when we were uh, when I was at lend up and another company that I looked at that had a very similar um, a similar product was called Atypica, and um, that's another one that I'm interested in uh, maybe exploring next time I'm shopping for tools. Um, we right. don't have anything like that at Envoy yet, just because it's so early and they haven't had someone leading the recruiting function. So we don't really have anything like that yet, but I would look into it for the future for sure. And, and that's difficult too, because you have so much that you're already doing and managing and then to listen to the demos and go through all the, you know, implementation process and then determining if, you know, and that ramp up learning curve of actually teaching your, you know, training your employees and your recruitment team, how to use it. That's a lot. So, um, but, uh, so that's, int I'd be interested to hear how it, how it goes and what it is that you choose. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've been really fortunate because at all of the places where I've worked, I mean, it's definitely a, a team effort. There are the different people on my team are very involved in different components of building the recruiting function. It's it's completely a team effort, not just me. And so, for instance, um, for the for the tools, that's a great example. It wasn't usually me doing all the research all the time. Um, I might sit in on some demos, I might not, but I had trusted people on my team who could also very effectively review tools and make recommendations to me. And then once we were rolling out a new tool, um, you're right, it is a lot of work to even implement something and have it be used to its full potential. So that was one of our, our goals was uh, if we did buy a tool, make sure that we understood all of its features and that we were actually using it to its full potential. And I was usually relying on one of my teammates to really um, spearhead that and lead the effort. It wasn't always me. It was a for sure a shared effort. Oh, that's so good. Like hearing about like the team collaboration coming together to put those uh, tools in place. Um, so, so tell me a little bit about once you get the approvals and, or actually, I'm sorry, once you, when I want to back up when I want to talk about presenting, uh, to the executive board. I mean, I imagine there's, there's a lot of that for when you have something that either you're looking to implement or you, um, you want to hire, tell me about some of those challenges, challenges or what, what you might, um, reasons why you might be in that position. Yeah, I mean, based on my training, I've always been really deep into recruiting analytics and understanding what the numbers are. So I really don't go to an executive uh, with an ask if I don't have a really good story behind it and a really good um, sort of documentation of, of the why and the how. So for me, it's usually just a, uh, you know, a simple presentation of numbers. For instance, if we're doing um, head counts and we're trying to staff the recruiting team and understand how many people we need um, on the team and what they're each going to do. We do have some figures where based on historical data of the company and based on benchmark data, how many recruiters uh, are needed to fill X number of roles, for instance. And some roles are more difficult than others. Some roles take longer than others. So taking that all into consideration basically take the numbers from the company's workforce planning numbers and what the executives want to hire, kind of plug it into my model and have a pretty good idea of how many recruiters we need, at what levels, senior recruiters, junior recruiters, um, in what departments. I usually bucket the recruiter skill set into like a technical recruiter. Sales recruiters are also a sort of a specific skill set. Yeah. And then we have the other bucket which is everything else the, the general administrative business corporate you know whatever you want to call it but I usually look at it um, from those three functions as well as level of recruiter and then I have a similar model for recruiting coordinators um, depending on what else they're doing um, they're not in my teams the recruiting coordinators are not spending a hundred percent of their time just scheduling they're doing lots of other things for their own career advancement career development just to keep the job interesting basically so um, depending on what percentage of time they're spending scheduling we can have some predictive models on how many um, 
interviews we expect to be scheduled each week or each month, and then how many recruiters, uh, re sorry, recruiting coordinators do we need for that as well. Um, so I usually will plug all the information into my models and then understand what my ask is and then go to the executives with that kind of information. Here's what we need and here's why. And the other good thing about that is, you know, recruiting is very fluid. Someone might think, you know, maybe we need to hire 20 engineers, maybe they need to crank it up to 30 or back down to 10. And with this model, basically you just change the number um, and it will change the output. So it's pretty straightforward and flexible. So uh, something that I've been looking at a lot in these modeling sort of circumstances um, is Tableau. And um, at our next conference, the Tech Recruit Conference in July um, 2019, the theme is people analytics and um, data analytics. And so that's actually my background. Um, I come from a data analytics background, I have a degree in corporate finance. And so when I first started out of college, that's what I was doing. And there is definitely that piece of me that just always loves to absorb data and, and work from the data into uh, developing or um, making decisions on things. And so I, I feel as though there has been this, this sort of evolution in recruitment where data is so important and a lot of um, human resources departments and, and recruiters are utilizing that data to make those decisions. Do you feel like that's something new or is this something that you've always done? Um, well, we've always looked at, I've always looked at recruiting data. So I kind of grew up in the management consulting world. My early career is at um, doing recruiting at management consulting firms. And um, so I think that sort of upbringing, if you will, has really uh, ingrained that in me. They were definitely looking at data. We were looking at pass through rates. We were looking at success rates. We were looking at interviewer calibration, offer accept rates. Where did our offer declines go and why? Um, so we were all always looking at recruiting data. I think now we have even more data. We can get even more detailed. Um, I feel like before it was probably more manual and now we are using things like Tableau or Chart Chartio is what I used at LendUp. Um, and so, so I think that, I think that we have been looking at recruiting data for a long time, but maybe it's, um, we're using different tools now, or maybe we're looking more deeply at data, but mm -hmm. um, it's definitely important. There's a lot there and it really does tell a story. You really do want to look at your candidate funnel. Where are you getting people um, applying from? Where are your on-sites coming from? Where are your offers coming from? Um, you know, who's accepting your offer? What percentage is going through the whole recruiting funnel? Those are all things that, you know, I think just are, um, you know, the way we're tracking things now, it's a lot more automated. And so it's, uh, I think it's, it's easier to create those dashboards, maybe before we were um, doing it manually or something in an Excel spreadsheet. I think you completely nailed it because it is, it's, it's that, that from the manual to the automated version and decision making and the ability to put all that data into a model and yeah. and to automate it and how it is that you're able to do it now is so much easier and intuitive where you can make those those decisions and it is funny but if you look back you you kind of think to yourself well this is nothing new i've i've been working with data for a long time you know you were saying that you've been doing this you know, since you were in, um, you know, management consulting. And um, so it's not really anything too new to you, but it's maybe like the process of pulling it out and, or, or maybe, um, you know, people accepting it or, or what have you. Um, but that's, it's interesting. So, so going, so we talked about, you know, how you develop the plan and the strategy and you get, you get the approvals and then, and then you, you move forward with uh, how you are going to develop that plan and, and where you're going to hire, whether it's a sales team and, or a recruiter for a sales or whether it's recruiter for, you know, tech technology and how long that will actually take with the numbers and the amount of hiring that you need to do. So, so now, so now, you know, you need to hire. What do you look for in a recruiter? This is like the big question, like, do they come from the agency? Do they, what, what do you look for in a recruiter? What makes a good recruiter? 
Yeah, so I definitely don't have any um, certain background or certain model or cookie cutter approach to hiring a recruiter. Um, definitely looking for someone. I think the first thing is that they're a good listener. A lot of times people think that recruiters are good people persons or very outgoing or something like that, but it really, it's, um, they really need to be a good listener because we're, we're a matchmaker, we're solving a puzzle, and we need to ask questions and listen to the cues that the candidates or the hiring manager are giving us. So I think uh, listening skills are number one for me. Um, candidate experience, always high on the list. Somebody who has that customer service mentality um, really caring about the experience, not only that the candidate has, but um, hiring managers, other stakeholders within the company, and um, on the team. I want someone who's going to add to the team environment and not take away from that. That's just as important to me as someone who is a really good recruiter. Um, we have to up-level the team and, and support the team. So those are some, um, you know, some of the softer skills that I I, that I look for, you know, in terms of the hard skills, I don't think a recruiter has to come from an agency background. I have no recruiting agency um, experience at all. Uh, that being said, I've seen um, agencies who do a really great job training people. And so if I'm going to get a tech recruiter that's been at, a, at an agency before, they're probably going to be well trained and have some good uh, skills. So I'm definitely not opposed to it, but it's also for me, not a deal breaker if they don't have that. Um, so yeah, those are, those are some of the things that kind of jump to the top of my mind. So you are hiring for recruiters right now. Um, mm -hmm. You want to tell us about some of the positions you're looking to fill? Yeah. So we have a couple of recruiting coordinators that just accepted offers. So I'm very excited about that. So I think that one's going to close. Right now, we definitely are looking for tech recruiting. That is something that is, uh, you know, completely outsourced right now. And I really want to bring that in house for a number of reasons. So hiring a seasoned tech recruiter would be is, is high. It's next on my list, really high on my list. Um, and then after that, building out the rest of the tech team, I'm, uh, it's, you know, we're waiting for that workforce plan right now. The executives are building it to understand what the hiring needs to look like exactly for the next 12 months. So that will help me determine how many tech recruiters I need. And then after that, then the sales recruiting is going to be the next order of business to bring in a couple of good sales recruiters. And, um, you know, Envoy's open to remote workers, so we do hiring across the United States. For the recruiting team, I'm hoping to get people who are on site because that will really help create a really great candidate experience so that when the candidates come in, they meet their recruiter, it's kind of full circle. And I think that in the future, being more remote would be fine, um, but I'm hoping to find people here in San Francisco for, for now. Um, a couple of things come to mind. Um, N number one, I, I, I'm in Los Angeles, so, and I often feel like there is a real competitive market out there in, in San Francisco, especially with, like it being Silicon um, Valley and just especially for tech recruiters. Do you sometimes feel challenged in finding really good tech recruiters? Definitely. In fact, some of my favorite tech recruiters that have worked for me are remote employees. So yeah. I have I have always had uh, on my team a variety of remote employees, whether tech recruiters, sales recruiters. Um, you know, my my first choice is to have the team on site, but I won't say no to the rock star recruiter who does happen to be remote. So what happens then yeah. is the in-house team kind of picks up the slack. Like at LendUp, I had two tech recruiters and they were both remote. And so I greeted every tech candidate. So there's a little bit of a trade-off um, when they don't have the recruiter on site. So we, we make up for it. Um, some way one way or another <laughs> yeah yeah so and um so the other thing i was gonna ask about is um there seems to be i feel like not just in the data evolution we talked a little bit about that and utilizing data on the back end and for decision making 
but also uh, for recruiters and sourcers to have um, a lot more of the marketing component to to their DNA, if you will, or their tool set. Yeah. Um, the ability to nurture candidates when they have a database of skill sets that they're looking for, or if they're building a pipeline. Um, you know, and so I wonder too, if that's something that is appealing to you when you're hiring a recruiter, somebody who has that, that, um, that data or that knowledge, uh, that marketing, where the, whether it's the ability to put ads out or run a pro programmatic uh, ad campaign, mm -hmm. or just um, understanding the search engine optimization of their job descriptions. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I try to centralize on my team and have um, a really solid sort of recruiting marketing plan that we all follow. Um, having someone on the team that is an expert at that or very good at that is a huge bonus. Um, so yeah, I think that that is, that's really, really important. It kind of touches on that employer branding side of things. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that that's really important so that we can try to differentiate and really um, you know, highlight what is different about, for instance, this company so that we can attract the right candidates to come here. So that that's huge. If a, if a recruiter doesn't have it off the bat, I think it's usually teachable. Um, but if someone were able to join the team um, that already has that sort of ingrained or built in or good training, that is for sure icing on the cake. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that's really interesting because they're I, I often ask, especially when I'm, I, as I'm recruiting for my conference and for speakers, you know, where is your, you know, your talent acquisition team in regards to nurturing the funnel? Like, as you mentioned earlier, you know, like in the tools that you utilize, you know, and do you have a dedicated marketing professional within your recruitment um, team that is helping with that and, and developing your employer brand and are they doing it through talent acquisition? So maybe I'll ask you, is that something that is in your marketing team or do you have somebody dedicated in your talent acquisition team? That's usually um, lives in the, that, that job or that um, duty lives in talent acquisition. Um, there are folks in marketing. If there are folks in marketing for the company, they kind of have to switch gears to try to figure out how to um, bring that skill set and, and that um, approach to recruiting because candidates are a little bit of a different um, different target market, if you will. So I've had um, basically a recruiting marketing person or employer branding person is kind of on my wish list um, for the teams that I've built. Um, we have had different people who have helped out in that way. Um, but that to me, like first we have to hire the tech recruiter, we have to hire a recruiting coordinator, but you know, that is something that I have my eye on, especially at Envoy. Um, and I'm hoping to carve out some space on the team for someone who focuses on that because I think what's happened is in the smaller companies anyway, it's a little bit more of an afterthought or it would be a nice to have rather than we're going to go out and, and hire for this and make it a priority. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I I was actually speaking with Will Stanny over at Proactive Talent, and and um, he's really big on on the employee employee branding and telling stories. and And I'm hearing a lot of this sort of I think of it as a hashtag, the buzzword, the hashtag of the employee storytelling. You know, where it's employee branding, but it's also telling our story and like about the people who work here and, you know, not that uh, we got this round of funding or we were established in 1800s or, you yeah. know, it, but more about this is uh, Susan and she's been working here for two months and she is inspired by XYZ and these are the things that she's really working towards. Just, you know, your personal story about why you work at Envoy. Yeah. And um, so it's just, it's really interesting to see how companies are, are taking advantage of, of that sort of thing. And, you know, I think with anything, everything just is always evolving. Like, how do we get onto this? How do we, you know, take advantage of these trends? And so, um, but that's interesting how you guys are, are uh, how you're thinking about the marketing and your employer brand. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super important as I'm still absorbing um, what is needed at Envoy. I'm kind of learning the players, learning what we need to accomplish. Um, recruiting, marketing, and um, employer branding is very, very high on my list, yeah. 
Um, so we talked a little bit about your tech stack and your ATS and, and the tools that you guys are utilizing over there. Um, and, you know, and it's always a challenge getting people on board with those. I'm curious just in that realm, just from what you're seeing and, and just trends in general, for 2019 in talent acquisition as a whole, are there certain trends that maybe you are clued into or that you see that are very interesting? Um, I mean, I think some of the things that are exciting to me or that I'm thinking about are um, programs kind of using the, the AI technology to help recruiting. So I don't think that it will replace a recruiter or any of the value that we add or things like that, but just some tools to make our lives easier. So, you know, the scheduling bots were extremely helpful um, when I was at LendUp and we had a bottleneck on scheduling because we had a, you know, a, a blip that lasted for, you know, four months. So we didn't need a whole person for it. And it kind of replaces the need to maybe hire a temporary worker. So, you know, the, the scheduling bots, but also the, the AI that is, associated with some of the diversity like we were talking about before because um, building diverse teams is so important all of the tech companies that I talk to want to do better we want to have a better represented um, you know group at our company that represents the you know the United States or the geographic area where we are everybody wants to do better and again having some of that technology behind us to help us track the data help us know where we're succeeding so we don't have to mess with that and that we don't stop doing that but then also where can we improve so i think some of those um some of those tools um they have a ways to go nothing is that i've seen is really you know knocking it out of the park yet i don't think in my opinion there's not a leader yet in that in that industry of these um, companies that will kind of tack on to your ats and help you understand your data but there's um, there's some some good uh, there's some some good contenders out there. So th that's what has that's what I have my eye on. I I totally agree with you. I it's 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 spot on, and I agree with you too. Like the whole automation and the AI and making our jobs as recruiters easier. And I've seen some companies who've done amazing jobs. I mean, just just automating a Boolean search. My goodness! Thank you so much. I, I know that I've worked with a, um, I've worked with a company before in doing tech recruiting, and we were working on these QA roles. And it seemed that every candidate we submitted to them just wasn't hitting the mark. And so I brought the hiring manager over to my desk. We sat down. I opened up. I think it was Monster or Indeed, and we just put in a search we put in some keywords we developed a boolean search and we just and we just saw what came up out of the the things that he gave me that he was looking for and he goes hmm that's not at all what we're looking for i said okay well what how can we change this and as we were going through it we determined he wasn't looking for a qa professional he was working for a software development engineer in test which in test yeah which is very similar but different and once we did that that little that little change the the types of candidates we got were way different and the quality was way better and it would hit the mark but that one little change so there's these boolean um automation tools that are out there hire tool does one of them social yeah. talent makes another one that's free um and i remember you put in just one keyword and it, it spits out this huge Boolean search that gives you every keyword it could, that could possibly be associated with it to give you like, you know, a huge net of candidates. And I just thought, thank you. So those sort of tools, and not that that's AI. When I think of AI, I think of more predictive analytics where it can help you assess what's next. Mm -hmm. But on the automation piece, there's a lot of good stuff that, that's out there. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. Definitely. Um, so you, when you participated at LAX Tech Recruit, it was the first conference I had ever done. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience? Did you enjoy yourself? What was it like? 
Yeah, I thought it was great. I thought the quality of the panelists and the speakers were fantastic. And um, I thought the content was great. So I, I could not have been happier. So in July, we're going to be doing our next conference. And, and this is where my challenge is, Susan, is in finding content and finding training that professionals such as yourself could use, right? Mm -hmm. So while you are in the trenches and you are building out talent acquisition teams, there's always something that maybe you could be doing better. So if there's training out there that you feel that you would want to learn more about, what would that be? Um, let's see. Uh, let me think about training for myself. Um, with regards to recruiting specifically, I mean, I think at smaller companies, management training um, is probably important, but that's not really tech recruiting specific. But I do think that in recruiting a lot of um, good recruiters get promoted to manager and at big companies they might be um, fortunate enough to have training but in most cases in all departments across all of the smaller companies that I've worked at management training is pretty uh, pretty non-existent so you know that that comes to mind just thinking about um, I mean, I've been fortunate because I did work for some larger companies earlier on, so I, I did get a little bit of that. Um, but every time I go through another training, I'm always, even if I've already been trained on it, I always am reminded of something or learn something new. So, um, so there's that. I think that uh, I've been pretty fortunate with data analytics at LendUp. We had a data yeah. analytics um person that we hired for the for the recruiting team and um, that was the one who built the dashboard pulling data out of greenhouse into a um, chartio report it was like a live up-to-date dashboard which was great but i would say um i don't know about for myself but i think data analytics is always uh pretty big because there's no one way to do it and there's so many different tools and so many different ATSs. So I would say data analytics would probably be um, something that I would attend and a lot of people would probably be interested in. Yeah. Well, it's funny. That's the theme. <laughs> right. Uh, the next conference is people and data analytics and how do you take advantage of your data to make decisions and how can that also be predictive? Um, that and as well as, you know, all the the other training that we offered. Um, but that's, that's really the big idea, that we want it to be a day where you come and you learn um, about strategy, about innovations, about new tools, because really who has time to sit and listen to all the pitches and the demos and all that sort of thing. Um, I know I didn't, and that's why I developed tech, the LAX Tech Recruit Conference. So do you have any um, anything that anything on the agenda that you're going to be doing for the or uh, plans for the rest of the year or projects that you're working on other than building a whole team at Envoy? Yeah, uh, I mean, building the team, um, recruiting operations is always really important to me because I think that is how you um, get a strong foundation so that you can scale the, the company and scale the team. Um, I think I was really fortunate with that at Glassdoor. We were able to really get in early and build a strong foundation so that as we had to hire more recruiters or hire more Step, you know, people into the company, we had a good foundation that was repeatable and we could quickly and easily do that. So um, I want to do that here at Envoy and make sure we just have a really simple, we're not recreating the wheel every time we want to open a new rec or make an offer or what if we're making an offer and we're outside the comp bands, um, you know, just have really streamlined process so that we can move fast. So for me, building the team, recruiting operations, um, the sort of foundation of that I think is really important. And then, I mean, if I had to say right now, third on my list is probably what we were touching on earlier, which is that employer branding and recruiting marketing mm -hmm. side of things that, um, you know, tends to take, uh, tends to take a backseat behind hiring some of those more, um, tactical roles first. If you were to give um, as we wrap up here, if you were to give um, advice to a talent acquisition leader who was charged with building 
a talent acquisition team, what advice might you give them? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is to, um, you know, not just build what you know, but really modify and create something that's specific just for that company. Because even though they might have been on a really great team before, the, um, you know, the logistics of it don't really apply necessarily to the next company, you know, really understand what the overall strategy is and how the talent team fits in um, so that you can build exactly what's custom needed for that company. Hmm. Are there, that's great advice. Are there certain, I don't know if there's sites or resources that you like, I don't, blogs, websites, books that maybe you would recommend? Um, I do love Lou Adler. He's kind of the recruiting Bible. Yeah. Um, and I've met him a couple times and uh, including at your conference. Those are great resources. Yeah. And we love Lou too. He'll be at the next conference. He's my, <laughs> I told him he's, he's what, um, he's what George Foreman did for the grill. He did for yeah. my conference. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you have him, like he's a great anchor. He's fantastic. He was one of the highest rated speakers at both of our conferences and he's just really engaging and um, he has a new product out. He actually, actually has a training videos and that you can download from his website to train your recruitment staff, which is, I think another trend that we've been seeing is, um, you know, when you bring in recruiters, especially if they're green or maybe even if they need to update their skill sets or upskill, um, that it's done continuously, not just at the beginning. And, and that generally, I think, makes happy employees in any department is that continuous education and training. And so, yeah, he has, um, that, that's one of his products that he actually has now, which is, which is really exciting, I think. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that um, a little bit. I haven't used it yet, but I, I saw it. So it's, um, I'm, we, maybe we'll dig into it. We might need yeah. it. Yeah, oh, definitely. Okay. And I feel like you're my go-to person for um, ramping up talent acquisition teams. Yeah, I think that's a good niche for me to talk about because I've done it at a few places now and each place is a little bit different. So it's not like there's a cookie cutter approach. All right. Well, thank you, Susan. I okay. will, uh, you have yourself a great evening. Okay. And stay out All of the right, rain. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. you're such an inspiration because you're always so professional and really just um, making stuff happen and that you're always you know really just digging for you know the next um, recruiting question that we're all asking um, you know we all have this the question and and you're you're giving some voice to it and some light to it so thank you people walking by and stuff yeah it's we just built out this space so it looks kind of empty there but um we have like desks we got it looks like no one's here there's desks over there i promise <laughs> it totally looks like you're in an empty warehouse <laughs> i know should i take you out there and show you like that there really are people if you want to show me around you want to see it yeah okay, okay. so this is uh are we just acquired this right now What's that? Are we in your office or is that a conference room? That's a conference room, yeah. So it's all open floor plan. So we did just build out this side of the office. So this is like HR, recruiting facilities, stuff like that. And then here's the empty space that I was apparently showing you before. And then um, the other side of the office is where the original sort of envoy was. We just built this space, uh, built it out. In fact, there's still like construction going on, but um, this is the original side of the office. I'll be a little quieter because people are working here. Wow. But um, this is our reception area. Oh, and actually today's a good day. So it's High Five Nails is here giving um, mani manicures. And oh. I just got a manicure a little while ago. So there's nice that. Part. And um, yeah. And then here's the, the rest of the office. So that's where most of the San Francisco office is. Hi. Kitchen sort of lunchroom oh. space. Did I lose you? A little bit, but then you came back on. What a okay. cool space. 
Yeah, so I really like the space. Um, uh, we have like family style eating for lunch every day. So everyone just sits with whoever, even if they don't know them. So I've gotten to know tons of new people because you just there's catered lunch every day and you just sit down next to whoever's at the table, kind of like in Europe, and you just talk to whoever's right there. Oh, I like it. Yeah. I, I really like the the vibe. Yeah, it feels it feels like a good camaraderie there. Yeah, they did a really great job with the build out. And, um, you know, the the idea at Envoy is just to make the, um, you know, the office experience delightful. So basically it needs to be delightful when we're in here. So I think they did a good job with that. Well, thanks for the tour. 